Well, let's begin to find some seats tonight, and we'll uh, we'll get started here in a moment. Praise the Lord! Does everybody feel like they got a good meal and they're ready to take a nap now? <laughs> we have to stir you back up. So why don't you stand? And I'm just going to uh, remind you that Romans 12:1 says. Paul is speaking to the church and to believers, and he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would offer your bodies as a holy and living sacrifice, which is your only reasonable service of worship. And I was thinking about that today. For those of us that need to rationalize things, if you really think about it, it's reasonable to worship the Lord with all that you've got. It's a reasonable thing. You don't even have to have faith for it. You just... You just logically can come to that conclusion. So we're going to do that tonight. He's worthy of it all. And so, Father, we thank you that you've given us the provision of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he helps us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We yield our hearts to you tonight. We find that it's a reasonable thing to do, to worship you with all our body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name, and your people agreed and said amen. Amen. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he beautiful? So beautiful, God. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he wonderful? My Jesus. Isn't he
into the room. Sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist when you walk into the room. Oh, the dead begin to rise because there's resurrection life in all you do. Sing that again. And when you walk into the room, sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation, oh, it ceases to exist. When you walk into the room, it can't begin to rise. Because there's resurrection life in all you do. Personalize this. Sing, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Love you, my Jesus. And I love you.
again for me. Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne, and so we will be coming home. You're
can't get enough all this is for Jesus my Jesus Just find somebody and begin to pray over them and just say the name Jesus. Jesus. The name that is above every name, the name that has the power to heal, to deliver. We thank you, Jesus. There's no other name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Jesus, we love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. We thank you for every circumstance bowing its knee to the name of Jesus. Every relational issue bowing its knee. Every physical issue bowing its knee. Every emotional issue bowing its knee. Every mental issue bowing its knee to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Every financial issue bowing its knee to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the testimonies of financial breakthrough because those circumstances have bowed their knee to the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. We confess you as Lord to the glory of God the Father tonight. We confess you as Lord of all. We confess you as Lord of this hilltop, Lord of this city. We declare you are Lord of this region, this state, and this nation. You are Lord of all. We confess you as Lord. We confess you as Lord. You are Lord. You're Lord of the breakthrough. You are Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we confess you as Lord of all. As King of kings and Lord of lords. We confess you as Lord tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we want you. Thank you, Jesus. So come and consume, God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Oh, we want you. Thank you, Lord. Your Lord. Come and consume, God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want more, 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 we want more of you, God. Yeah, we want more, 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 we want more. All we are, we give you permission. Our hearts are yours, we want you. Oh, we want you. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Lord, we declare that your rulership and lordship over our life is increasing. And the manifested peace of God is also increasing over our lives. We thank you, Lord, that there is no end to your kingdom expanding in our life, expanding on this hilltop and expanding in this city. Lord, we declare of the increase of your government and peace, there is no end. And Lord, we just speak peace right now over the homes, peace over the marriages, peace over the children. 
peace, Lord God, over the finances of every family that's represented in this house. We speak peace from this hilltop over this region. We call back, Lord God, those who are, have abandoned their families. We call you back to take up your responsibility and be a father to the fatherless. Thank you, Jesus. Your peace increasing. In Jesus' name. Ushers, you can come. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we celebrate your goodness and your faithfulness. And Lord, we are the, the ones that are sowing the seed that you've already given us. And you said, he who supplies seed to the sower. Lord, I pray for anyone in here who is struggling with lack. Lord God, that they would begin to sow what you've already given them so that he who sows seed to the sower would become manifest in their life. Father, we pray for those who need jobs and better jobs. Those, Lord God, who are due raises and bonuses. We declare, Lord God, scholarships and grants. Lord, that this would be a house of unusual favor when it comes to scholarships and grants. We pray gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. We declare housing and better housing. Father, we declare that the spirit of poverty is broken over this church, this region, and our lives. We declare the angels release to tear down that stronghold of poverty and rejoice that it is just torn down and destroyed in our life in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that we have more than enough to give into your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that we're not in a kingdom of lack, but we're in a kingdom of abundance. And Father, I speak blessing on this seed tonight that's sown. And Lord, I declare you provide seed to the sower. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just praise the Lord for the worship team, and that was that was wonderful, <clears throat> refreshing. Well, it's an honor tonight to have uh, Brother Chris Gray with us, and uh, I'm going to let you introduce Thomas at the right time. So, uh, but um, Chris's calling and passion is to bring awareness to the plight of the orphan and the fatherless, which is why he is regional coordinator of Christian Alliance for Orphans, ambassador of Life Song for Orphans, Ambassador of Lifeline Children's Services, and Executive Director of Zacchaeus Tree Orphan and Adoption Ministry. You really do all those things, right? I mean, you're like superhuman. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's called living out your passion. However, his most prestigious role and important responsibility is sharing adoptive parenthood with his wife, Andrea, of two beautiful internationally adopted girls, Hannah Claire and Ava. Uh, and um, let's honor, honor Christopher Gray as he comes and shares his heart with us tonight. Amen.
Well, I want to thank you all for the uh, opportunity to be at your church tonight to come and worship with you. We've already had some worship going on already tonight. I heard Thomas over there singing real loud. He should be up here on stage with him. <laughs> um, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you, Amanda, for this opportunity. And I've gotten to see a friend of mine. On, I think I thought she was in here earlier. Oh, there she is. Graduated with Kim a long, long time ago. So it was good to kind of catch up with you. Oh, yeah, just yesterday. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And uh, then got to meet your wife earlier, and we've had several friends in common, so it was kind of good to kind of um, learn a little bit about that and share with each other. Uh, my name is Chris Gray, and I work with Zacchaeus' Street Orphan and Adoption Ministry. That's my uh, weekend job and my nighttime job from 5 to 12. Uh, from, eight to, from 8 to 5, I work at Regions Bank, but uh, that's my nighttime job. My uh, wife and children, they don't always get to go with me when I travel. I go all over the state. And uh, they don't always get to come with me. She has bronchitis right now, Andrea. So and, um, so my children, they're not here either. They're with her. They're mama's babies. But um, I have a picture um, of them. So that's Hannah Claire's on the left, and we adopted her uh, in a little town called Lomonoso, just a little bit outside of uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And we adopted her when she was about two years and four months old uh, in 2009. Uh, so we've had her for eight years. She's 10. And then Ava, we adopted her last year from Warsaw, Poland, in March of last year. Uh, you'll get the joke here. We say that it's World War III in our home. This time, Poland invaded Russia. So that's, that's how we uh, refer to them now. But um, anyway, we love them to death. Um, now, you won't hear this every, every Sunday or Wednesday night, but I would... Uh, like I said, they don't always get to go with me, so I always encourage families just to take out their uh, cell phones. If you have a smartphone, if you have Facebook, you can go to Zacchaeus Tree Orphan and Adoption Ministry. You can like us and share us and follow us. And you may think to yourself, why is that important? Well, I'm going to tell you a quick story. About a year ago, I had a man who gave me a call. He was a pastor at a church down in Hattiesburg. And he told me that um, someone had liked my page and shared it and it went across his Facebook page and guess what he started the adoption process because of that by someone just liking it so you may think that's very insignificant but it's not um, secondly um, um, I, I was, I, I'm used to looking at another picture but never mind don't, don't worry about that up there um, I was off track myself just then um, I want to thank your church for everything that it's doing right now. Uh, I know that your church is, has four foster families, and I am so appreciative that uh, not every church that I go into has families that are already participating somehow in taking care of the orphans. So I want to commend you for having a church body that's doing that. And I know Amanda does that back there. Yeah. So... Thank you to your church for doing that and for your church body that is supporting these families. That's it's very critical to the process. So I, I highly um, want to say commend you and thank you for doing that. Um, before we get started, I want to lead us in a word of prayer, then I'll get us going. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight in worship. Thank you for the worship team leading us in worship already. Thank you for their pastor, for what this church is already doing in the lives of foster care children here bless them bless their families bless those that are supporting them at, at during this juncture uh, just continue to bless this church bless all the people here and thank you for being a father to the fatherless amen so I got a quick question to everybody now I have a little uh, little person right here who here had a favorite toy when they were growing up as a kid who, okay, so maybe you had like a Barbie doll or maybe a stuffed animal for the guys. Maybe you had an action figure. Well, for myself, uh, my grandfather was a dairy farmer, and I had a little farm set. And this is a little Fisher-Price men from, now if you're over 40, you'll know what I'm looking at right here. If you're under 40, you're like, what is he looking at? But this is one of the original little figures here from the um, Fisher-Price men. And when I say original, the, the new ones are all plastic. But this one here was a wooden one. And as a child, my, my, now my father is a pastor, and as a child, I was, they, they lived in a pastorium, so we lived pretty close to the church, so we could walk to the church. So 
one Sunday morning, I couldn't have been maybe five or six years of age, walking to church, somehow the little man, this little man here, falls out of my pocket. I don't know what happens to him. I'm probably worried to death as a five or six year old. Like, where's my little man? Where's my little man? And anyway, after the church service, walking back back home, I found him. And he was on the ground. But he had been run over. And he was broken in half. And I can't, you know, that's been too many years ago, right? But I can probably imagine that I was probably crying. And I was probably pretty upset about it. But here's the cool thing. My mom, and everybody here has one, they all have those loving hands. And she leaned down and picked this little man up right here and took him took him home for us, or t- took him home for me. And she glued him back together. She put the pieces of him back together. And so tonight I come to on behalf of you on those who are broken, the orphans and the foster care children. In James chapter 1, verse 27, the Apostle James writes a very clear statement. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I once read a quote that someone wrote about orphans, and it made a great impact on me. It stated, each orphan, no matter their location or their circumstances, is known by God. Each orphan is made in God's image and in his likeness, made for his glory. Each orphan is fearfully and wonderfully made. He calls them beloved. He calls them blessed. He calls them family. He knows every hair on their head. He knows every, each one of them by name, without exception. None of them are accidents. None of them are misfits. And they are his. And because they are his, they are mine, and they are yours. Adoption is beautiful. It's all the big things combined together. It's love, it's hope, it's joy, it's anger, it's sacrifice, all wrapped into one. It's crazy. It's crazy. And sometimes you've got to be crazy to step off into it. (laughs) But I tell you what, I wouldn't change my life for it. Adoption made me a dad twice with my two girls. Adoption is a faith journey. So if you know a family that's maybe going through adoption at this time, they're on a faith journey. And I can tell you every time that God revealed himself to us during each of our adoptions. I don't have time to tell you every story, but I'm going to tell you one of those a little bit later. For many orphans, though, and foster children, there's another side to adoption. And that and there's hurt, there's anger, there's conf- and there's confusion. And these wounds that these children are going through, they're deep. Their grief is real, and their tears and questions of why don't stop. Watching and listening to stories, your stories, it can be gut-wrenching. But just like the gospel, the great irony is that life comes out of great sacrifice. Adoption builds families, and adoption is an example of God's handiwork. In adoption, a child gets a family, and a family gets a new little boy or girl, and they get to experience the lifelong experience of the gospel. A brother or a sister, they get a new sibling. And everyone, I'm talking grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, they all get to have their souls transformed in sanctifying ways by becoming a family with someone who did not have one. Let me give you some statistics real quickly. If we combined all the orphans and foster kids in the world together, they would be the seventh largest country. Every 18 seconds, another child becomes an orphan in the world today. There are approximately 153 million orphans in the world today. To put 153 million orphans into perspective, if everyone stood shoulder to shoulder, side by side, they would wrap around our earth three and a half times. That's too many children. In 2016, Americans adopted 5,370 orphans internationally, according to the United States Department of Intercountry Adoption with 56 of these children being adopted by Mississippians. 
I just got these notes here from Thomas a few weeks ago. Here in Mississippi, there are 6,107 children in the foster care system. Here in Rankin County, uh, the last total I looked that you sent me was 125 here in this county alone. But perhaps here are the most frightening figures that I could give you. 90% of the children that are in orphanages will never be adopted. 39,000 children age out of the orphan care system that they are in every day with no mom, no dad, no place to call home. Some children as young as 14 years of age have to be able to defend for themselves. Statistics tell us that less than 1% of those who do age out will have a viable life after five years. In Russia, where my oldest child comes from, 10 to 15% commit suicide within the first 18 months of leaving the orphanage that they're in. 60% of the girls will become prostitutes, and 70% of the boys will become hardened criminals because they have to make a living. Now, did you know that God has a heart for the orphan? I heard y'all just, I heard, heard you pray about it. We sang, a, I think, a song talking about the father to the father was just a second ago, but I'm going to give you some scripture verses here. I'm not going to read every one, uh, and I'm not going to ask you to turn to them because I, I need to get through them kind of quickly here. But in Psalms 10, 14, God is a helper of the orphan. In Psalm 68, verses 5 through 6, God is a father to the fatherless. And in Psalms 146, 9, God supports the fatherless. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, God defends the orphan. But his heart doesn't stop there. He commissions each of us as believers to do the following. In Proverbs 31, uh, verses 8 through 9, to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. In Psalms 82, verses 3 through, 3 through 4, to defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. In Hosea 14, 3, to show the orphan mercy. And in Matthew chapter 18, verse 5, Jesus says, and whoever welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. There are three adopted persons in the Bible. The first person that most people think of is Moses. But the second person is Esther. The whole book of Esther. She was adopted by her, by her uncle that went on to save her people. But the third person is the person that most people forget about. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, you can read that Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit. Joseph had nothing to do with Jesus' birth. But Joseph was his earthly adoptive father. And finally, in, a, in, a, in addition to physical adoption, the Bible also speaks of adoption in a, in a spiritual sense. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, we can read, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. I really like a book that I once read. It's called Orphanology. It's by Tony Morita, and uh, who co-authored the book with Rick Morton. And in the book, uh, he made a statement. Adoption was never plan B for God. It was not an alternative solution. It was plan A. Before the universe existed, God had planned on adopting us into his forever family through Jesus Christ. You can read that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. God did not adopt us because of our attractive merits, but because of his amazing mercy. How exciting is it to know that we have each been adopted into the greatest family ever, God's kingdom family. Everybody here knows that Jesus came to save us, but we often forget that once we're believers that we are now adopted sons and daughters, that we are brothers and sisters of Christ. Adoption is intentional. Foster care is intentional. And ministry to the orphan is intentional. Now, not everybody is called to adopt. Not everybody is called to be a foster parent. I know that. I grew up with uh, an adopted cousin from South Korea. He obviously looked different from us. I grew up with a, with a cousin from uh, through the uh, foster care system off of Wednesday's child. I grew up with a cousin that was adopted domestically. Adoption has been a part of my life for well over 35 years. But as believers, we are not called 
to sit on the sidelines and drink Coke and eat popcorn and think that it's someone else's job to help take care of the orphan, to help take care of the foster care child. So what is it that you can do? What is it that this church can do? Well, your church is already involved, but what else could you do? Well, for many people, they feel like they're too old or they're, you know, at this time, it's not the right thing for them. And that's okay. But what you can do is you can pray. But what else could you do beyond prayer? A simple thing that you can do for each foster family or for a family that's going through the adoption experience is to help them financially. They're not asking you to pay for their entire adoption expenses or to pay for everything that they're going through in foster care. But any act of service that you can do financially is well appreciated. I've been there. I know how, I know how blessed we were. But what else can you do beyond those two things? Well, the best thing that I could ever recommend to someone or a church family like yours that already has foster families here is to offer your gift of time and of service to them. And you may think to yourself, what do you mean by offering my gift of time and gift of service? Well, some easy things that you can do are this. You can make that family a meal. Maybe you give them a gift card to go out to go eat because that mom, she's tired of cooking. Maybe you go and you clean their house. I bet, I bet Amanda would love that. <laughs> or maybe you go and you want to, you know, wash their clothes and dry them and iron them for them. But, dads, I know you're kind of laughing. You're thinking, oh, that's all, that's all for the wife. I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> James 1.27 just did not apply to the women. It also applied to us guys as well. So what are some things that you can do? You could go, you could go cut that, that newly dad's grass for him. Maybe he's not a handyman. I'm not a handyman at all. I couldn't, nail a, I couldn't put a nail on a board for straight if I had to. So maybe you can go and do some small repairs around their house for them. There are many things that we can do to offer for gifts of time and service. You see, what are, one of the things that we don't always understand are the things that these children have gone through. These children have been in orphanages and in institutions and through foster care family after foster care family after foster care family after foster care family. And then they get to the next family. And they just need that time to spend with their new mom and dad where they can have a time to build trust with one another where that new mom and dad takes a moment to listen to what they have to say to hear them to see them for who they are for who they can be in Christ I've given your pastor a, a DVD and some information on how to start an orphan care ministry here within your church I've told him earlier I said I'm not asking you to launch this for you to do it but maybe there's a family here Maybe there's a mom here or a dad here who would like to maybe take that role on, to be, to be that person for this church. I'm going to give you three challenges for today. And then I'm going to tell you an adoption story about, uh, about ourselves. Number one, I would challenge you to continuously pray for the orphan, for the foster child, and for their families, their moms and dads. Number two, and your, your church is already doing this, so it's, it's hard to say this to your church, but I'm going to say it anyway. I would challenge you, maybe there's a family here tonight that would like to step up to become another foster parent here in this church, or maybe to start the adoption process, whether that's domestically or internationally. I would like to challenge someone here to do that over the next two years. And then finally, uh, I just mentioned it, just to start an orphan care program here within your church. Those are the three challenges. I want you to think about what I'm going to say. The name Zacchaeus tree didn't come up flippantly. You all know the story of Zacchaeus, but what, I, but what intrigues me most about this story is when he ran to the tree to climb it, that tree had not always been there. That tree had been planted years before, meaning this. You may not have another family that's right now looking to become a foster parent or to become a, an adoptive parent anytime soon. But you never know when they're going to come to you to say, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm looking to get that process started. And just like that tree wasn't there the whole time, it was there when he needed it. So we need to start those orphan care and foster care programs now so that they can go ahead and be ministering to those that you already have here. I'm going to tell you a story here. I, 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 I haven't, this just happened just three days ago. 
On Sunday, I had contacted churches all around the state to stand in honor of the orphan for Orphan Sunday and Stand Sunday for the foster child. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you here. I couldn't believe it when I got the message back from the pastor. So I had contacted pastors for a couple of months, and the pastor writes me a message. He sends me something on Messenger. He said, Chris, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. He said, I had a family come to my church today. They don't even go to church here. They, were, they had been just kind of visiting around here in our area because they're looking for a church home. But she said to him afterwards in a, in, a, in, a, in a message, she said, Pastor, I don't even know why I came to you. She said, I wasn't planning on coming to your church service today, but I felt the Lord lead me to. And today you said a prayer for the orphan and the foster child. And she said, Pastor, I want you to know I have had an application to become a foster parent sitting on my kitchen table for over two weeks wondering should I do it or not. She said, your prayer today made me go home and go fill it out just because of a prayer. So I thank you all for what the pastors do. Well, let me tell you a quick story about myself. Uh, we didn't, now I grew up here, uh, and it's funny, I'll I tell you something, because Kim is here today, uh, the, the, her, her mom sold my parents their house when we, when we moved to uh, Pearl. And, I, you know, Zacchaeus Street, and I didn't plan this like this, but the street that I grew up on as a child where her mom sold our house to was a sycamore. <laughs> that was, I was like, that's kind of funny after we came up with the name uh, Zacchaeus Street. I was like, you know, that was our sh street name as a child. I always thought that was kind of funny. So tell your mom, thank you for that. Um, let me tell you a story about ourselves. Uh, we used to live in my family. We used to live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and when we lived there, um, uh, one of my brothers came up to come visit us one weekend when Mississippi State was playing Tennessee. Now this is when Tennessee was really good, so Mississippi State was got to be, get beat, and uh, it drove me crazy because I'm a State fan. But uh, anyway, my brother drives up there, and before the football game that night there at Neyland Stadium, my wife came up with a crazy idea. She said, "Chris, let's write down a list of birthday presents that we could buy Hannah Claire." for her birthday. Just something small, just a small token of reminder from where she's from in Russia. And we'll do age-appropriate gifts. You know, so when she turns three, we'll buy a stuffed animal. Age four, a Barbie doll. All the way to age 18, we'll buy a uh, Fabergé egg. And I was like, well, that's, that's fantastic. She said, I've got an idea. She said, we should buy a Bible. But not just any Bible. We want to buy a Bible that had been written in the Russian language. And I said, that's fantastic. All right, no problem. So we get our very first phone call. We fly uh, to St. Petersburg, and we're there. And you have to do everything you have to do to complete the adoption process. And so we're going to spend an hour with her in the morning, an hour in the evening. But we've also got things we have to do throughout the day. We're getting fingerprinted over there. We're getting being probed and prodded and interviewed and questioned and everything that you can maybe think of for the adoption process. But in the evenings, we had free time to ourselves to do whatever we wanted to do. And that could be go sightseeing there in St. Petersburg. We could go walk around to restaurants to do whatever. And so we would take our list with us everywhere we went. We would pull it out as we were walking by souvenir shops, uh, the little strip malls, the street vendors on the side of the road, uh, bookstores. And we would go in there. Oh, that's the perfect gift for age four. That's the perfect gift for age five and so forth. But every time we would ask someone, can you help us to find a Bible? They would always look at us, you know, shrug their shoulders or, you know, shake their head and just move on. But I was like, yeah, that's no big deal. I'll find a Bible. I'm, I'm here for a couple of weeks anyway. No big deal. Well, we didn't find a Bible on that first trip. But we did buy 10 of our 16 gifts that we had to buy. So I'm feeling pretty good. Hey, we bought more than half of what we needed. We get our second phone call in January of 2009. And so we fly back over again, and everything's just like the first time, but no Bible. We get ready to fly back over for our third and final trip. It's in February of 2009. The agency calls us. They say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Gray, you're going to go pick up Hannah Claire on your second day when you're there. I'm like, second day? Jeez, that's quick. You're going to pick her up on your second day after you pick her up. We ask that you don't take her out into the weather. It's 30 degrees below zero right now. It does not quit snowing at this time of the year there. To myself, I said, uh-oh, 
I have not found the Bible in over two weeks' time on either of my trips. This is the last present I got to buy. Everything else has been bought. And I got to find the Bible in less than 24 hours once I arrive. And I haven't found the Bible in two previous trips. What am I going to do? Pray. So we board our plane. We're in Knoxville. We fly to Atlanta, Georgia. We're in Atlanta, and while we're there at our terminal waiting for our bus, uh, bus, <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a long way to go, wouldn't it, for our flight to leave, uh, I see a group of women there standing around, and they look, they, they, they seem different. There was something different about them, so I went over, introduced myself, and was just talking with them. Found out they were missionaries. Asked them, where are you going to be serving? They said, Russia. I said, well, that's pretty cool. I said, we're going to adopt from Russia. Yay. And you're thinking, why are we going? Yay. Well, because I'm thinking to myself, there's been two plane crashes, and I've got these missionaries on this plane with me. God cannot let this plane go down like the other two. <laughs> well, the second plane, there was one that plane that had ice on the wings, and it crashed. And then there was the one they did about Captain Sullen, you know, that movie. So that happened right before we were about to leave. So I was kind of nervous. So we board the plane, and we, you know, we make it across the Atlantic. And, whew, you know, I'm sweating the whole time thinking we're going to crash because I'm just nervous. But anyway, we made it there fine, no problem at all. But I don't know how many of you have ever had a chance to get out and go to another country and you're in another country that, don't, that doesn't speak your language. It can be intimidating and especially overwhelming. So we walk outside. We're there. We see tons of like this buses and taxis. And these, we, these Russian men are just, just talking to us. I have no idea what they're saying. I don't, I don't speak any Russian. I mean, I speak this much, but not, not a whole lot. And I'm like, what do we do? How do I tell this taxi driver how to drive from this airport to this airport? I had an idea. I said, maybe one of these missionaries have someone with them that can translate for us. Walk back inside. Hey, do y'all have somebody that can translate for us? Yeah, we got this woman here from Texas. She speaks Russian fluently. I'm like, fantastic. Let me tell you what we need to do. Blah, blah, blah. We walk outside. We are walking in and between cars and taxis and buses. I'm like, that looked like that was a pretty good car to get into. You know, why didn't we stop there? But, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trusting someone else at this point. And finally, she stops at this bus. And it's kind of, and, and the, the bus that I'm talking about is like a J-Train bus that you would see in downtown Jackson. So the, uh, the, the, this, this missionary, she leans in, tells the bus driver what we need to do to go from this airport to this airport. Bus driver looks at us, waves us on to the bus. We had to be the most different looking people that day ever because everybody on that bus was dressed in black, kind of like you are there. You know, they got the black hats on, black shirt, black pants, black shoes, you name it. Gloves were black, you name it. Could have, could have, could, they could have had some off color, like a gray or something, but not very much, you know. But we look different. We are on this bus. I'm in some tennis shoes. I've been flying for 13 hours. I'm in some tennis shoes, some blue jeans. I got on like a sweatshirt. I got on a green, I know what color, green puffy coat. I got a backpack on. I got some huge suitcases here because we're going to be here for a few weeks here spending some time. And we looked different. And when we boarded that bus, you know, they knew that we weren't Russian. But we took our seat and the bus takes off. After a few minutes, for whatever reason, an older man came and sat down directly in front of us. Our knees were almost touching. As we continued to ride, for some unknown reason, I'm going to use, use my example, he looks over at us, and he starts making gestures with his hand. And then he kind of started pointing at us. And I'm getting kind of nervous. I mean, we're on, a, we're on a bus in Russia. And I know I'm in Russia. My parents know we're in Russia, but they don't know where we are in Russia because I don't know where I'm in Russia. I'm just on a bus. But like most of you are thinking, why is this man pointing his finger? And I'm thinking the same thing you are. What did his wife do to make, <laughs> make that man kind of mad and start pointing his finger? Well, for some odd reason, I don't know, because I didn't speak to the man and he didn't speak to me, after a moment, after just kind of making hand gestures towards us, he stands up, walks to the back of the bus, kind of nervous. I turn to see where he sits. He sits by the exit door. I'm like, Whew, what did you do? <laughs> You know, to her, why, do, why, do, why is this man pointing his finger at us? Why is he, you know, making these hand gestures? Because I don't know what's going on. And they could be talking about us on the bus for all we know. 
So to ourselves, I remember going, you know, let's just focus on the ground. Don't look at anybody. Don't make eye contact. Whatever. Because I'm afraid for my life at this point. You know, they, they may be trying to do something. We finally get to our bus stop. The bus driver turns around, looks at us, motions for us to get off the bus. Andrea stands up first, and she starts walking down the aisle. I'm five or six steps behind her. I'm carrying because I've got a, I've got our suitcases in our in our uh, backpack and all. I'm st- struggling through this stuff here, walking down the aisle. And after a moment, that old man and I we lock eyes like we are right here. And he takes his hand. Just imagine you had a railing right there in front of you, like the like the little handrails when you're on a bus, and he puts it on it. And he's sitting down, and he puts his hand on the rail, and he starts to stand up slowly. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's odd. Why is he standing up? And then the closer I got to him, he started to stand up straighter. And I got a little bit closer. He starts taking his right hand and putting it inside his coat pocket. Now, you've all seen Russian movies like I have. (laughs) It doesn't end well for the American when the Russian man puts his hand inside his coat pocket. I'm thinking to myself, I've got like maybe three steps left here, Lord. I've got to get off this bus. This man's about to take me out for whatever something that Andrea did. I'm blaming it on her. You know, nothing that I did, right? I get to that exit door, and I get ready to step down. And the old man takes his hand, pulls it out, and puts something in my chest. I grab it with my free hand, step off the bus. The door's closed to the bus, and the bus drives off. I didn't know what he had put in my hand exactly because I was, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how scared I was. But I stepped off the bus and I looked down and I knew exactly what it was. It was a little Bible. But it wasn't, you may recognize this, these little Bibles here. It wasn't just any Bible. It was a Bible that had been given to him by the Gideons. But more than that, it was a little Bible that was written in the Russian language. I never spoke to that man, and that man never spoke to me, but he gave me a testimony to tell, that proved to me how much God has a heart for the orphan. There are over 45 scripture verses that talk about God's heart for the orphan and for the little children. Maybe there's someone here tonight that wants to become a foster parent, and you want to start that process. Or maybe you want to begin the process of adoption, whether it's domestically or internationally. Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, Chris, I I don't think I can adopt. I don't think I could do foster care. But you know what I could do? I could support those that do that process. Maybe you fall in one of those three categories. And I would like to urge you to get with your pastor tonight or maybe to get with someone who's who's already a foster parent. That's why I come in. Because I know they would love to help you to begin that process. I know I would appreciate it. And those children, they'll appreciate it too because that's the number one thing on their bucket list is to become adopted, to have a mom and dad that love them for who they are and for who they are to become in Christ. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to be here. I want to introduce you all to Thomas Gent. I'm going to let him take over here for just a moment. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to set a timer. It's for accountability. So when this thing goes off, uh, not trying to distract, but it just helps me stay on task. I want to thank Chris for letting me tag along here tonight. Thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to come, even though I'm Linda and Carrie Goff's son-in-law. Don't hold that against me. Um, no, we, we love them so much. Uh, been a big part of our family. Um, so I'm basically, I'm, I'm a foster parent. been a foster parent over three years. About two years ago, started talking about calling, praying about job, looking for that right, better job. Just was working to work. Couldn't figure out what I want to do. was like, I kind of want to do something more with foster care. Two years later, I get a call. Start working for the state of Mississippi in the middle of July. And the cool thing was, it wasn't just I got to do foster care. It was I get to do faith-based and volunteer services. And so what does that mean? The majority of child protection services doesn't even know what that means yet. We're still working on that. I cover the central and south part of the state. Um, I, I get to come to churches. I get to talk to people about foster care um, and about supporting people, families that are fostering or adopting. That's, that's the fun stuff. As a state employee, i got to do a lot of other things that maybe aren't so fun. But t- talking to churches, talking to families, talking to people, 
uh, representing these kids. That's the cool stuff that I get to do. Um, so one thing I do is I'm pretty low pressure. I'm not coming to your pastor or your church and go, hey, a church this size, we ought to walk out of here with five foster families. Um, I think churches have personalities like people, and to be honest, I don't know yours. I've been here an hour. I'm no expert on your church. I know the church I go to in Jackson. I know its personality, but 7,700 churches in Mississippi, they each have a personality, and I'm not cocky enough to come in and tell you what you ought to be doing. Uh, what I want to do is go is just help you to engage. That's kind of where I am. I'm a resource. I think of it like a funnel. I stole this from men's ministry one time. So, and I just want to get people in the funnel. I just want to get churches in the funnel. And so t- t- in a funnel, you know, at the bottom part, it's the tougher stuff, like the fostering or adopting. Maybe that's not for you. That's okay. Chris did a great job of, you know, it's okay. Maybe you're too old. Maybe you're too young. Maybe you're too pretty. I don't know what it is. Too something. It's okay. But they're too tired. There you go. Uh, but I think there's stuff, there's stuff above that stuff in the funnel that you can do. Like make a meal. Now, I can't make a meal to save my life. You can ask my wife. But I know there's, I know there's a bunch of women that can or, or men that can, people that can. Um, maybe you donate. Every day of the week, we need beds, um, cribs, pack and plays, car seats. I got a family in Forest right now looking for four twin beds. Um, that's a huge need. Maybe that's something, I mean, we got storage units. You know, there's probably 10. I could probably throw a rock to 10 of those things in, in down here in downtown Brandon. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe you donate time. Maybe you go mow somebody's grass like you were talking about or clean somebody's house or stuff like that. Um, there's also something called the Heart Gallery. You may or may not know about it. It's Mississippi Heart Gallery. You can Google it or you can pick up a card and email me about it. I'll bore you to death with information. The Heart Gallery, the cool thing about the Heart Gallery is is that it puts a face with the problem. Chris gave you some stats, kind of stole my thunder a little bit with the stats I gave him. The stats are actually improved a little bit. We're right below 6,000 kids in care as of about a month ago, about 59, 83, I think. Uh, so good, we're going down. That's good. I think the Rankin County number actually went up a little bit, but overall we're going down. The problem is, is that number is kind of a gut punch. And even though you've got four, four foster families in the church and you can put a face with the problem, most churches that we get, that I go to and talk to, they don't, they may not know a foster family, so they hear that number and that number is a gut punch, and that may affect you tonight or in the morning or maybe a week from now. But a month from now, you didn't connect with that number. Um, I, we just we're people. We connect with people. We don't connect with numbers. Um, and so I think that what the Heart Gallery does is kids that are legally free for adoption, and so that that that, that number ranges. And the Heart Gallery is just a, just a display. We come and put in churches. Um, Display, it displays the kids that are legally free for adoption so we can use their pictures. It gives you a profile card um, where you can take the card and pray for them. And so maybe it's, maybe it's prayer. And I use all very sarcastically here. Maybe all you do is take a card in prayer and pray for that kid. You take a ki- and you're a part of that team, though. That's not more or less important. But you take a card for little Johnny. And you, you know, let's, like, let's just go to this example. There's, a, there's an elderly... Uh, female, single, or, or widowed, um, you know, limited income, and she can't foster. She can't adopt. She's not in place of her life. She can do that. But she takes that card. She takes little Johnny's card. She goes home, and twice a week, she starts praying for little Johnny. We all know how prayer works. Little Johnny gets adopted. Six months down the road, let's say little Johnny gets adopted. And then what does she do? All right, I can check that box. I'm done. That's not how it works. She calls me back up and says, send me another card. We send her another card. And then eight months down the road, little, little Susie gets adopted. And what does she do? She gets another card because there's always going to be more kids. And she does that for, let's say she does that for 10 years. She's a part of that team. She's a part of that family. I'll tell you, I kind of close with this. Um, when we, we were foster parents. We <laughs> it took us a year to get licensed, which is re- I'm a state employee. I work for the agency, but it's re- it was ridiculous. And a year is ridiculous. Um, I don't know how the story of the, the families here, but I'm, I've heard similar stories. So we're in a car lot right up the road buying a car. I'm changing jobs. I'm losing the company vehicle. I'm buying a car. The social worker calls. My wife goes, "Hey, it's it's Miss Taylor. What do we do?" And I said, "We tell the car salesman to hang on a second, and we're going to answer this call." Congratulations, Mrs. Dent, your licensed foster family. Um, 
Congratulations, Mrs. Dent, you're a licensed foster family. That's great. I got a two-month-old boy I want to bring over. And my wife freezes up. I'll never forget her face. She puts, she puts her hand over the phone and goes, we got a, uh, we're licensed to be foster parents. They got a two-month-old little boy to bring over. What do we say? And my wife, and Carrie and Lynn will tell you, my wife's the strong one. She's the smart one, not me. And she, and she does that. But the thing is, when you've been doing something for a year, you forget what you got into it for. A, a year, 12 months later, we thought we got into it for the paperwork and getting phone calls not answered. We were used to not getting phone calls answered and doing a bunch of paperwork. Not actually taking kids. That's crazy. And so I look at her and I say, and I, I still can remember her face, and I say, what do you think we say? We've been waiting a year. We say yes. And she was totally on board. It's just one of those moments. So they say, all right, we'll have them over there in an hour and a half. Four hours later, we're sitting at home. Car pulls up. Me and my, I got two birth sons. They were six and four at the time. There's some tree work going on in the backyard. We live in Ridgeland. Um, and so they're, we're kind of watching that. She goes, they're here. I turn around. The door's hitting the wall. She's gone. I can't even see her out the window. She's gone. And she's not an exerciser. She's not fast, but she was gone that day. We go outside. I get the boys up. We go outside. Mama mode's kicked in. She's got little Brandon. So anyway, Brandon, we come inside, uh, and we're kind of we're kind of all you know. Christina's in mama mode, doing super mama stuff. My six and four year old are kind of freaking out, even though we've been talking about this for a year. I'm doing what they're doing, but I'm just doing it a little better because I'm an adult, <laughs> freaking out. But we're up. Me, the the three of us are kind of sitting on the couch, going, "All right." Knock on the door. I, I thought we'd had enough excitement for the day, but I go to answer the door. A couple in our church. Holding a bag. I live, I live a mile away from Fresh Market in Ridgeland. They're holding a bag. It's got a pot pie in it, which I think is the unofficial meal of foster parents everywhere, but um, that's, that's for another day. Pot pie, some cookies, and something else. I don't even remember what it was. That was the most important meal I've ever eaten in my life. That was the most important meal. That family's never fostered, never adopted. But you're never going to convince me they weren't a part of the team. And so wherever you are today, I think you use your talents and get off and get in the game. Everybody, I heard this. At, I heard this. At, I know y'all have a relationship with the Vineyard. I was over at Vineyard a couple weeks ago, and I heard them say, I heard Bo say, everybody plays. That's what this is. Everybody plays. If 77, I, got, I stole this from somebody else too. There's 7,700 churches in Mississippi. If every church did something, maybe every church, if they just had one foster family, we'd have a waiting list of parents, not kids. My, last thing, my thing is I want churches to hit singles, not home runs. I don't need to go. I don't need to go hit all the mega churches, all the Pine Lakes, and the big churches. And go, hey man, if you'd hit a home run, I could go rest in my office. I need every church to hit a single. You're probably already doing that with your families here. I'm not. I'm probably preaching to the choir on this, but it's, it's part of my spill. So anyway, I really appreciate the time. Me and Chris would be glad to. to if there's any questions, we'd be glad to address those. Just uh, raise your hand, and I'll hand you a microphone so everybody can hear it. And I'll start out with the first question. I have a question that um, the uh, my oldest daughter has a good friend that they got into the adoption process. And as they went through the selection process of who was going to get to adopt a baby that um, was going to be born and be put up for adoption, there were five. It came down to five couples. And they were the lucky ones and were chosen. Four couples went away without a baby. Uh, my question is, why is it so difficult for uh, couples that want children to get children if there's this overabundance of children? I can't speak for adopt. I'm not as familiar with adoption probably as Chris is. I think part of it is ages. I think if you look at the number, if the you look at the 5,900, and just in, let's just take foster care numbers, 5,983 kids in care. I don't know the statistics, but the number that are probably 10 and up, it's not 50-50. It's not spread across the board. I think that's 
part of it. I don't know. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah. I think even in, even in foster care, when we when we went to our classes, they go, everybody wants a baby. You're going to be waiting. You're going to have to. There, there's not babies available. Well, that's that's just not true. I, in three years, we've had three babies, uh, and so I don't think that's true. And you do what you can. Um, some people are called for older kids. We birth order was important to us, and that's how we made the decision. But I I think it's it's the the numbers aren't scattered equally across the board. Amen. We all know all that. So I'm 60, I'm a widow, I'm not poor, I have a great farm, and my husband, when he was living, we would kick around, you know, we should adopt a young man to raise as a son because we, we only had daughters. So now that my, my youngest daughter, my only daughter's married, um, how impossible it would it be for me to adopt a 13, 14, 15 year old girl or boy and raise them and get them through high school and then college so they're not a, a statistic um, I mean I'm no expert on this but I know that, I know that you can uh, do foster care even at your age I know that I know that that is a possibility because I know a pastor down in the Prentice area. And he's a little bit older than you, and uh, he's a foster parent. And I mean, just recently beca became one uh, this year or last year. So I know that I know that that is a possibility. You just had probably. I think uh, one thing to do is be check out that heart gallery. All those kids are older are older than I think. The last time I looked at it, I think they were all twelve and up, and they sort of they give a bio. Jasper Lowe's who does it, and you can take one of my cards and I can connect you with him. But I think they do a good job of sort of giving, you know, as much background as they can have. And if you do it through the state, um, it's ch it's cheaper. It, I mean, international domestic privately is really expensive. I'm not knocking. I think both things are hugely important. Don't don't hear me. I want you to hear that. Through the state, though, it's it's virtually free. Um, it's, you know, we're talking about a thousand dollars or yeah, that'd be where you go. You have to foster them for six months, um, but that's that's more of a, you know, just let's make sure this works before we do all the paperwork. And and so when you go to the heart gallery, there's like a, there's a, if you click on the kid, there's a color dot, I think, under the name, and it sort of gives you where they are in the process. And it may, and some of them are already in that six-month placement. They're just waiting out the six months to be adopted. And so some of them are actually in homes where we hope they're going to stay. We're just not going to remove them off until it's a done deal. So some of them, and they're, and they're adding kids, if not monthly, maybe sooner than that. I, I, they're legally free for adoption. So, so Brandon, the little boy I told you about, we adopted him in August of this year, three years later. So babies, you're not gonna, babies aren't going to be on the heart gallery. It takes the state a long time to terminate rights and everything. The kids on the heart gallery are terminated. They're 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 legally orphaned. Um, is um, it, yes, ma'am. That some of them are in foster. Some of them are in foster homes, waiting for a permanent placement. Maybe maybe there's something that the foster family uh, doesn't. There's not. It's not a good connection. They could be in a shelter or like a group home. Yeah, but that's where I would go if I was you. You work for the state, and uh, my question is this. How come there doesn't seem to be any consistency between judges and the way they handle situations? Because some judges seem to be totally heartless and will take a child out of a good situation with a foster family and put them back in a situation that is not good. Yeah. Uh, you aren't kidding around with that question. Uh, <laughs> anybody got a softball? No, I'm just, no, no. I think you're right. I think there's inconsistency in the court system. I think we got to be... One thing, one story I'll tell you on that is our second foster son, we had him for a month, two Christmases ago. So about two years ago, he came to our preemie. Mom got caught dr on drugs. Um, 
he got taken away. She busted her tail, got herself in treatment. Um, anyway, he had some complications. He had to stay with us a month before he could go live with her up in the Delta in the treatment center. And my wife was taking her back, and I was fine, like emotionally. It was a, it was a month, and he was a preemie. He's real little. I, I don't really connect with kids until they grow into their face. I don't know if that, that's probably a bad thing to say. It's just true for me. My birth kids, too. I just, it was like six months, four or six months before I was like, okay, I kind of get you now. Anyway, we loved him. We took care of him, but I didn't have this, like, connection. He ate and he slept. There. So anyway, but I was trying to watch out for her and make sure. She said, no, no, I'm fine. She calls me at work, and she goes, this is harder than I thought it was. I said, what do you mean? And she said, I realized that Beckham was his name. Beckham is not going to live the life he would have lived at our house. But she followed that up with, and that's okay. I think this mom, there, there's situations across the board are different. She loved, she loved her son. She just made a mistake. I make mistakes all the time. I think there's inconsistency in the judges. There's no doubt about that. You can check that. If, you, if I showed you a state map with a breakdown of, of kids, there's, I mean, obviously, Hines County, bigger counties with bigger cities are going to be higher, but there is some inconsistency there. I have some private thoughts on that, but I'm not obviously not going to. I'd like to be employed tomorrow, so I'm not necessarily going to share those. I don't know the answer. I think, I think we love, we try to meet, what I would love to see is a turn to, to minister to the birth families when possible. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree, but in a situation like where, I mean, we've dealt with this situation. You got a birth mom that's trying to get into a rehab that'll take the child with them. And so they're like, but the state has already said, this child cannot go back into the house you're living in. So they're going to pull that child out of my house to go for a three month rehab program. Right. And then put it with a different foster family. Right. So I'm just trying to understand some of the stuff. It like common sense seems to not be a part of the program. It's it's just being in it for four almost four months. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like as a foster parent, I totally agree. I, I can see it from both sides and even inside. It's inconsistent. County to count. I mean, I can go a direction to another county and it's different. Um, I don't have an. <laughs> I hate it. I just don't have an answer. I think, I think, I think what we do is. I just think we support if we if we can. Um, I think there's a problem out there. I'm not saying this is where you're going with this. This is just me talking. There's a problem with Christian foster families in some instances that love that child but hate that family. And I think that's something we got to be. We you know. I'm, somebody may give me a tongue lashing after this is over for saying that, and it won't be the same thing. I, I, I think there's a difference. Uh, we take kids for abuse, and we take kids for neglect. Abuse, there's a line, and when you cross it, you cross it, and there needs to be penalty for that or consequences. Neglect, neglect can be we should have gone to the grocery store three days ago, and we didn't, we got busy. It wasn't that we weren't eating. It's just that our fridge is empty. Neglect is just a gray area where where I wish there was more consistency. Yes, but it's going to go a little different than you thought. 200 million flowers used to do Rescue 100. The state just took it over like a week ago, two weeks ago, brand new. The state's going to do it in-house. It, Rescue 100, sorry, Rescue 100 is like a training weekend where you can get licensed. So where it took a year, now we're going like four or five months. Yeah, four months. It basically depends on the home study. So the next event that we're, we're doing is going to be up in uh, somewhere in northeast Mississippi. I can't think of the, the name of it. Um, northeast Mississippi. We're going to go to a church. We just, we just had the vision meeting with pastors yesterday. And basically, you come for a weekend, intense weekend, Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And you walk out of like what, what was taking like six to eight weeks of classes. 
you knock it out in a weekend. You do your fingerprinting. And we're actually moving. I mean, a year from now, some of that's going to be online. So we're probably going to knock Sunday off of it, and it'll be even faster. And then you do a home study afterwards. Uh, but it's a way to, to – and we go to churches. 200 million flowers was under contract. Um, like, it just changed. Sorry I had to hear it this way. Um, but the state – yeah. The state took it, has taken it over, and we're, we're going to be doing that process. Justice Dickinson's our new commissioner. Um, he's been in, I think, maybe two, I think two months. He wants to ramp it up. We've been doing four a year. That's going to go up, I'm guessing, to probably eight, probably double. We hit, we'll hit more spots in the state. It'll be back here. It'll be back in, in, in the metro in the, next, in the next year for sure. Well, praise God. Why don't you all stand? And let's just give the Lord a praise for these guys and what they've brought tonight. Thank you, Lord. We bless you guys. And uh, really, uh, Hayes and Lindsay are here, and Dan's in here, and Amanda's in here. So three of our families are really represented. Wasn't Amanda in here? I, get, I thought I saw. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Al and uh, Liz Hurt also are foster parents, so I wanted to kind of point these families out if uh, – if the Lord puts something on your heart to bless them and uh, to be a blessing to them, then, then keep that in mind. So uh, God is good. Obey the Holy Spirit and the kind of things you've heard tonight. And so I'm glad they came. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed hearing that. It's not something you discover unless you're in that realm. So thank you for coming, guys. And uh, I know those parents need to get their children. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you loved us and that you've not given us a spirit of fear or bondage uh, to bondage again but you've given us a spirit of adoption and sonship by which we can cry Abba Father we have a father in heaven a daddy that loves us and so we have that upon us and that's what we in turn love others out of so we thank you for that Lord and we give you glory and honor and praise tonight in Jesus name y'all be blessed amen <laughs>